próxima palestra, convido novamente o doutor Edward Mahoney para abordar o tema estimulação elétrica e agentes físicos para cicatrização de tecidos, aplicações clínicas e estudos de caso. Por favor, doutor Edward Mahoney. Ok. Como eu disse, a primeira parte foi sort of the science of wound healing, the whole process. Now we'll get into what we can do to help promote wound healing. Okay. Um, that's home for me, LSU Hospital in Shreveport, Louisiana. So, so for this portion of the talk, I would like to describe the role of electric fields in wounds, select proper electrotherapy equipment to promote wound healing. <clears throat> Then, very important, we need to figure out if a wound is appropriate or not for stimulation. And then the last part will be explain a general understanding of the evidence for e-stim and actually a couple other modalities in regards to wound healing. I keep clicking too fast. So, like I said, there's a few wound pictures, not many. So when wounds are difficult to heal, what we want to know, is there a role for electrical stimulation? If there is, how should it be applied to be effective? And perhaps most importantly, why does it work or why does it not work? So the goal is to attempt to answer these questions today. <clears throat> so the main reason, or really the basis for e-stim and wound healing, is if you want, you can simplify, or you can oversimplify the skin to picture it like a battery, where you have one charge on one side and an opposite charge on the other side. So in our skin, those numbers are probably a little small to see, but they're all negative numbers, uh, meaning the skin is negative on the outside and relatively positive on the inside. The main reason for that charge differentiation is because of the directional flow of ions. Okay. So we have the sodium potassium pump being an example. You have ions flowing in one direction, and in addition to that, the skin's ability to keep those ions separate. If we just had flow back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you wouldn't have a charge, right? It would just all balance out to zero. Okay. So the positively charged cations, for example, sodium, potassium, get pumped inward toward the basal side or the bottom side of the cell And the negatively charged ions, usually chlorine, gets pumped out. So again, our net result is more positive charge in and more negative charge out. So with intact skin, we're able to keep that charge separate. Okay? So the inside of the body is positive. You can kind of think of the skin as a capacitor. It's a way to separate those charges and store potential energy, okay? Because the charges want to come together, but they're not able to across the healthy skin. <clears throat> so what we call that potential energy is the trans-epithelial potential. What it is, it's the amount of force you have that's able to push the current call it voltage. Okay, so how much push is there that can push the current into the body? In a wound, the resistance is a lot lower because we've removed a lot of those dry keratinocytes on the surface, right? So in that case, the low, volt the low voltage pushes the current out of the wound. There's nothing to stop it. So our transepithelial potential drops to zero at the wound surface. Okay. So as you can see in the top graph, this one, the transepithelial potential decreases 
as it gets closer to the wound edge. So on here, in millimeters of wound, millimeters from the wound, this is the edge farther away. Okay. So the blue is transepithelial potential. As I get close, current's going out, no separation of charge, no potential energy. On the flip side, in red, farther away, no current flow, closer and closer, higher current, because I'm getting current leaving that low resistance wound. In the bottom picture, you see the wound surface will then develop a positive polarity at the wound margins, while we maintain our negative polarity in the adjacent intact skin. Okay? And it's also positive on the interior, just like we said before with the picture with all the little numbers that you couldn't see. Okay? <clears throat> so in the epithelium, the outer layer of skin is damaged, the intact peri wound remains negatively charged that creates a relatively weak positive charge at the wound margin, which you can see there. Okay. The wound margin, in turn, is less positive than deeper tissues near the wound bed. So positive, but less positive than here. And that, in turn, is less positive than cells further away. So what we've created is a cycle, a way for current to flow. This is, uh, I don't know how endogenous transfer is. This is normal current. I'm not talking about applying e-stim. Okay? This happens in your body without electrical stimulation. But what we do with electrical stimulation is try to assist this or augment that current. So what we do in e-stim and wounds is use the fact that the body is made up of different charged particles to our advantage. Opposite charges get attracted to each other. Like charges repel each other. So if we have a simple monophasic setup where current always flows in one, the same direction, the anode, which is positively charged, attracts negatively charged anions, while the negatively charged cathode will attract positively charged cations. Okay. For example, in wound care, you might want to attract a cell that has a positive charge. So you would place the cathode over the wound area. Okay. Now, the directional migration of these cells when exposed to an electric field is termed galvanotaxis. Okay. And really, that's the basis for applying electric currents to a wound to stimulate healing. So galvanotaxis is not the only factor that's playing a role. Right? Accepted cues that guide cellular migration into the wound include chemical substance release, which means that substances released by the cells that are in the wound attract other cells. Right? Another factor is contact inhibition release. Cells that are next to the wound edge don't have a neighbor cell on the wound side, so they move towards the wound. <clears throat> Empty space is another cue, a third cue. The cells move into the wound because there's nothing stopping them, because they can. Population pressure, very similar 
these are all very similar. This one, the cells that are growing next to the cells at the wound edge push them into the leading edge of the wound. Okay. And number five is injury stimulation. So an injury produces a stimulus that recruits activated cells to the wound. And that's actually what we talked about a little while ago, in the last part. <clears throat> so the electric field <clears throat> is still the most important. In a review of literature by Zhao from 2009, they found that when you applied an electric field to a single layer, they created a scratch wound on a monolayer culture of rabbit corneal cells, eye cells. When the Easton was applied in the same direction as those other cues, those five that we just mentioned, what do you think happens? It speeds up the cellular migration. I have e stem working with the other cues. Okay. Now, when they flip the polarity and you expose the, the wound to a current going the opposite way, so migration factors going this way, East M wanting to go this way, it slows it down or potentially stops it or reverses it. So what they found with a very low electric field, less than 12 millivolts per millimeter, that significantly slowed the cell migration. Turn that electric field up to 25 millivolts per millimeter, it stops the cell migration. It's stuck. Crank it up above 25, it goes the other way. So we can apply e stim and make those cells go against their normal direction. Let me make sure this video will work. I think it will because Nadia fixed it for me. What does Feshar mean? Open? Next slide. Next slide. How do I get off of this thingy? Hmm? Okay. So the wound is on this side. That's the wound edge. We're looking at this. Let me see if I can figure out how to pause this. Um, I'll just play it a few times. So when the e stim goes that way and the cell migration factors go that way, it speeds it up. When e stim goes this way, it goes this way, despite the cell migrations going that way. Okay? So what it shows is the electric field wins. That's what the cells follow. Really kind of impressive. Um, we'll get back to this because it's changed some of the ways we think about wound care lately. So we know it's clear that electric current causes cells to migrate. We just saw that. What's not as clear is why. Okay. So there appear to be multiple signaling pathways that help to explain how the polarity causes migration as well as other responses. The first proposed change caused by our electric signal is creating membrane receptor asymmetry. 
So what we mean is there's an unequal distribution of receptors at the anode and at the cathode. Okay? For example, an electric field <coughs> causes a redistribution of epidermal growth factor receptors towards the cathode or towards the cathode side of the cell and that leads to migration towards the cathode. The second factor, uh, these are hard to translate, I'm sure, involves phosphoinositide 3 kinase. Just, sorry. <laughs> Just, uh, we'll call it PI3 kinase and phosphatase and tensin homolog. We'll call it P10. When activated by an electric field, PI3 kinase and P10 activate protein kinase B. That, in turn, produces the desired effect of cell migration and proliferation. I have a graphic on the next slide that'll help with that. The third factor involves our other signaling mediators, a kind of a big lump together group. So when an electric field is applied to tissue, membrane potentials of those tissues change. Okay. And it's theorized that the plasma, <clears throat> the plasma membrane on the side of a cell that's facing the cathode depolarizes. So what do you think happens on the side facing the anode? the opposite. It hyperpolarizes. Again, ask the question, so? Well, it affects ion flow in and out of the cell, and it also affects directional cell migration, which is exactly what we care about, right? That's what we're trying to do when we apply e-stim, or when it happens normally, is make cells migrate in the right direction. Get the skin cells to march across that wound and close it. Okay. <clears throat> so as a review of what I was just saying, it sh this picture shows the role of the endogenous, meaning your body's natural electric current in wound healing. So an injury occurs. When the injury occurs, it activates that endogenous electrical signal. Remember, when we didn't have an injury, we had no current. We had a separation of charge, but nothing was moving. We get the injury, get the current. When the current <clears throat> works with the other signals that we talked about, the five things that make something move or not move, when those all work together, they're going to activate receptors and in turn activate intracellular signaling pathways. Okay. Among those pathways are the two we talked about, the PI3 kinase and the P10. Okay. By activating the PI3 kinase and P10, that becomes important because that's what allows for the galvanotaxic response or the movement of the ions. Okay. <clears throat> So from there, we have the PI3 and the P10. Now we can activate through a series of complicated steps, PAKT, which is the activated form of protein kinase. Okay. That activation is critical. So as you can see, once activated, it can stimulate migration proliferation, cell survival, and cellular metabolism. Take home point, clinically, it means that whole process leads to wound healing. So that's kind of nice and very complicated. Okay, so we know that eSIM has been used a lot. It's very widely used and very widely researched in wound care. Just like our natural 
electric fields change the way that cells move through galvanotaxis, we can apply an external current, right? Just like we did all in the labs yesterday and the day before. <clears throat> so by applying an electric, an external electric current, we can cause the directional migration to be altered. <clears throat> so if we want that current to produce the same effect or to alter the effect of the endogenous current, there's a few things we need to consider. The first is what type of current are we going to use? We mentioned a lot of different currents over the last few days. Right? <clears throat> um, second, even if you choose the right current, if you choose the wrong amplitude, at best, it's ineffective. At worst, it's harmful. Okay? And then the third question that becomes very important in wound healing is polarity. <clears throat> so which cells are going to be attracted to the anode? Which cells are going to be attracted to the cathode? Based on my goal for healing, I decide how to set up my e stim. Okay? <clears throat> so, if the goal of e stim in wound care is to create a directional flow of ions and charged cells, which of these currents do you think would be the most appropriate choices? So, remember, galvanotaxis, we want a directional migration. We want that to go in one direction. So let you think about it for a second. <clears throat> okay. The first one, alternating current. What's my net ionic flow after that alternating current? It kind of, it's like a little hamster on a wheel. It's going there, back, there, back, there, back, there, back. And by the end, it hasn't gone anywhere. Okay. So that one we don't really use in wound, wound care. The third one with the question mark is kind of interesting. Uh, we'll come back to that because um, there actually is some evidence for a symmetrical biphasic and asymmetrical biphasic uh, current, even though we may or may not have a net ionic flow. <clears throat> so, like I said, we'll come back to that one. What that really leaves us then for wound care are two options. We have direct current, which is usually going to be microcurrent, or we have this one, which is monophasic pulsed, high volt pulse current is what's shown there. So let's start out with direct current. First, the key feature of direct current is the constant polarity that's going to cause the ions to go from here to there. Okay, it's, it's pushing like a, con a battery that's on all the time. It's always making it go the same way. Okay. So no reversal. And to be considered direct, it's on for at least one second. Okay. Because of the potential for tissue damage with higher levels of direct current especially, it's typically delivered at low amplitude, like I said, in the microamp ranges. Remember, a microamp is one millionth of an amp. So we're talking about very small amounts of current. <clears throat> so if you, need, if you want an effect, you're probably going to have to deliver this for a much longer time. Okay? This isn't a two-minute treatment, a five-minute treatment, a ten-minute treatment. In fact, there's actually some new dressings out on the market that can deliver a microamp current for up to a week at a time. It's an absorbent dressing, and it's stimulating that wound while the dressing is in place. <clears throat> so here's some of the concern with direct current. When we apply direct current to a solution that has electrolytes, or in more practical purposes, to tissues that contain electrolytes, it causes the positive ions to move towards the cathode and the negative ions to move towards the anode. 
at the cathode, sodium ions react with water, and they make sodium hydroxide. At the anode, chloride reacts with water, and you get hydrochloric acid and oxygen. At therapeutic levels of direct current, then, we end up with alkaline, or base, and acidic responses at the cathode and anode, respectively. Yesterday, people talked about a current dose, right? meaning current amplitude times time. The way I explain current dose to my students is if there's a fire over here and you want to put it out and you tell me I used a bucket of water, that's like saying I'm going to use e-stim to heal something. You didn't tell me much. I can change two things to make sure I can fill the bucket up a lot and use a few buckets, okay, so that would be a very high current amplitude, or I can leave it on a lot, or kind of our frequency aspect, so I can put a lot of buckets on there and get the same effect, okay? So that's what I mean by our dose. How much current are you going to give to this wound to make it change? If it's too low, you don't get anything useful. If it's too high, those pH changes cause tissue irritation. Oftentimes, what we end up seeing in that case is blistering and redness, erythema. Okay. <clears throat> so, because of those potential complications associated with the alkaline and the acidic environments, you don't see direct current used quite as often as you used to. There are some exceptions to that. One of the few ways it is still used is over a silver dressing in wound care. I don't know if, I know a lot of people were students, if you've had wound care yet or not, but ionic silver, like AG plus, is antimicrobial. So that's why we'll use it over a silver dressing in the wound, right, to try to push that silver into the tissues. <clears throat> So if we break down the most common types of bacteria, you have your gram-negative microbes have a negative charge. Your gram-positive, although it's not the major component of the cell structure, have a lipopolysaccharide coating. Not important to memorize that. But what's important is that has a negative charge as well. So both of them, gram-positive and gram-negative, are attracted to the anode. The silver ions, because they're positive, are repelled from the anode. Okay. <clears throat> so if you, it might be a little hard to see there. That says silver lawn, and there's a small, thin, that black line is a silver dressing, and then you have your conductive gel over the top of it. So what we're doing is stimulating over the wound to one, recruit those bacteria towards that electrode, and two, push the silver deeper into the tissue so they can interact with the bacteria that's in that wound. Silver's not magic. It won't go in by itself. It will only attack bacteria that it can come in contact with. Okay? It's not like a uh, an oral antibiotic that's going through your whole body. Right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so now they can bind, and like I said previously, there's a new dressing that contains 25 small little micro batteries per square inch with a silver formula in the dressing. So when it's activated by moisture, either you moisten it or the natural moisture from the wound, it activates the, um, the battery. And a small amount of voltage, you, uh, it says it ranges from 2 to 10 millivolts, becomes generated. So that small voltage, in turn, delivers current in the microamp range 
for up to seven days. <clears throat> a study that just was published, actually it just came out last week in the uh, Journal for Ostomy Wound Management found this dressing to be significantly more effective than a control group that used just normal moist wound healing. So not a lot of evidence out there yet because it's new, but it's kind of an interesting way to go. <clears throat> now other studies that have used either direct current or pulse direct current for wound healing rather than just as a means to deliver silver, like we were actually talking about the current doing the work, have, been, have reported many positive outcomes. In these, most of the um, studies have an amplitude or a current between 50 and 1,000 microamps <clears throat> um, for a variety of wound etiologies. I'm not going to go crazy into depth with each study because there's a lot of evidence for e-stim in wound healing. What I really want to focus on is the practical aspect of it. So like I said, you don't see direct current used as widely as it was once. <clears throat> in, in its place, what we see is a pulsed current, and specifically a monophasic pulse current that we call high voltage pulsed current. <coughs> The vast majority of the literature that supports uh, e-stim for wound healing involves this current, our HVPC. So, as the name implies, the voltage that's pushing our current is very high, potentially up to 500 volts, which I've, is not comfortable. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but typically, it tends to be in the lower hundreds of volts range. It's not galvanic current. It's often labeled galvanic with a misconception because it never goes below baseline. Okay, it's not biphasic, but that doesn't mean it's galvanic, meaning direct. To be galvanic, it would be on for at least a second. You can imagine if you had 125 volts on you for a second or more, that wouldn't have the best outcomes in the world. That would hurt like crazy. <clears throat> so the benefit, <clears throat> or actually a detriment to that, not only would it hurt, but those pH changes that we just talked about with direct current would be enormous. Okay? You'd have the alkaline and the acidic changes because of that huge current flow. <clears throat> In its place, what we have is a 1% duty cycle, typically on for 100 microseconds, off for 9,900 microseconds. So what you're seeing here, they may be hard to read, the, t the spikes are your peak current, just like before, underneath the area is your pulse charge, but because it's a 1% duty cycle, your total current delivered is actually low. Okay? It's don't, sometimes that confuse, is confusing. It seems like high volt, we must be sending you know, tons of current through there, and that's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> uh, so because of that, because of the 99% off time, you don't get those pH changes under those electrodes like we did with direct current. Okay. So that's a major benefit for us. <clears throat> so like I said before, I'm not going to go through every e study, but I did want to put some in here that are evidence for high volt pulse current. Like I said, it's robust. It's very strong evidence. Um, in a variety of wound etiologies. We have the first study was mixed. Second study was pressure ulcers. Diabetic, a few venous, another mixed, more diabetics, some ischemic. So really, the gamut of what we tend to see in wound care. Okay? So like I said, I won't go into the details of each one, 
but the chart does outline the 12 controlled studies and one case study. You see the Goldman 2000, the first or second Goldman study um, that demonstrated the effectiveness of high volt pulse current um, in chronic wound healing. Just for your information, the N, the number, represents the number of people in the treatment arm of each study, not the number of people in the whole study, control versus treatment. Okay? Um, if anyone is interested in these references, I'd be more than happy to give you my reference list if you want more information. I said, we have such a small, compact amount of information being thrown at you in three days. Just take my word for it. It works, they said. Okay, so high volt isn't the only form of pulse current we have. We could use low volt monophasic pulse current. <clears throat> and perhaps not surprisingly, the charge quantities, the area kind of under those shapes that are delivered to the tissues in low volt and high volt studies, at least in the ones that worked, was similar. So it makes sense. Whether I took one huge bucket and dumped it on my fire, or a bunch of little buckets and dumped it on the fire, I had the same amount of water to put out the fire. Okay. <clears throat> so the fact that charge quantities are similar is likely the reason that some of the low voltage and high voltage studies had very similar results. <clears throat> In the five studies, performed between 1989 and 1997. All of the studies um, used a low volt monophasic pulse generator with the same parameters. Okay? Of those, three of them found a significant reduction in wound size when they compared them to a control group in human subjects. That kind of makes sense, though. That isn't a major surprise. It's still monophasic. I'm still going to have ionic flow in one direction. I'm just changing the way I'm delivering the same amount of current. Okay? What's a little bit more surprising, or more interesting at least, in my opinion, is the evidence that supports low voltage biphasic pulsed current. Because this one, is not following our rules of galvanotaxis, right? I'm going this way, this way, this way, this way, versus always that way, okay? <clears throat> so although low voltage biphasic pulsed current, LVBPC, is not as widely used as high volt, I mention it here because there are some favorable results. <clears throat> What's important to note, though, kind of one of those, the deeper you look into something or the more you learn about it, the harder it becomes, you know, is that uh, it's not really specified in most of these studies whether the waveform is balanced or not. So if we don't know if a waveform is balanced or not, you can't determine if there is a net current flow, right? If it's a balanced waveform, same above, same below, net is zero. If it's unbalanced, I may have some ionic movement even though it's a biphasic waveform. Okay. <clears throat> Many of the low volt biphasic current studies actually used standard TENS units that were discussed uh, yesterday afternoon. So typically, obviously we know those are used for pain, right? And what when used, what they did was an indirect electrode placement. So to back up one second, for wound healing, there's two ways we typically will set up electrodes. One, the direct method would be moistened gauze, like, uh, saline or um, tap water, just not distilled because it won't conduct, or gel or something, and put the electrode directly over the wound. That's the direct method. The way the TENS units studies were done was the indirect method, meaning my wound is here and the electrodes are here, okay, just right around the edges of the wound. Um, 
and then you have your other electric, your dispersive or your reference or whatever the term of the day is somewhere else, okay? A big pad, because I don't want to build up current there. <clears throat> so, like I said, numerous case studies and several randomized controlled trials showed healing rates that are superior to the control group. These results, though, can't be attributed to galvanotaxis because we don't know if there was a net current flow. So my hypothesis, and this is mine, not from the literature, is that um, there are other factors. You know, it, we can't just look at it's simply galvanotaxis. We already mentioned those five other factors that will determine if it's going to go this way or this way. So what it seems like as a likely conclusion is you're doing something. You're changing anything. You know, you're making the vascularity improve to the area, whether it's biphasic, monophasic, low volt, high volt. Sorry, that was fast. Um, you're changing the amount of blood flow, which may be the main reason that they've demonstrated healing. Again, that's my hypothesis, not theirs. Okay. So, like I said, I'm not going to talk about every individual study, but there are a few meta-analyses um, analyses that we'll talk about. So really, some of the most conclusive evidence would be from the Gardner one, the Gardner analysis in 1999. Fifteen total studies were analyzed. <clears throat> in that group, 599 591 wounds were treated with E-STEM, while 212 wounds were treated as a control. You can see the healing rate per week for the E-STEM group was 22% versus only 9% in the control group, which is equivalent to 144% increased healing rate for the E-STEM group. In the second meta-analysis by Houghton and Woodbury from five years ago, they analyzed 2,265 articles. And the scary part about that, of the 2,265 articles they looked at, 19 of them were identified that met their criteria of controlled clinical trials involving human subjects with chronic wounds that had been treated with E-STEM and they did pre and post wound measurements. So not outrageous criteria. You know? So of those 19 studies they found, 522 patients were in the E-STEM group, 366 were in the control group. 12 of them had data that supported accelerated healing. Seven of them found no difference in wound healing. <clears throat> but what's interesting, when the five studies that assessed complete, completely healed wounds, ESTIM was significantly more successful. What I mean by that, some of the outcome studies in wound healing end at four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, say, percent reduction in four weeks. So the wound may not have healed completely, but it was 50% smaller. Right? But it seems that more of the wounds actually went on to closure when treated with E-STEM than without. Okay, so we know which current. We've got that figured out. How do we set it up? <clears throat> Since high volt is currently the most widely form of stim in wound care, especially in the U.S. I'll focus on the parameters associated with that one um, for now. So the literature reports a dosage of current between 250 and 500 microcoulombs per second to have the best outcomes. That's regardless of whether you're talking about high volt or low volt stimulation. Now that's tricky though, because unfortunately when you're applying a current through a surface electrode, you're not exactly sure how much current is getting to the tissue you're trying to, that you want it to get to. There's not a micro coulombs per second button on the machine. That'd be cool if there was, 
<clears throat> um, so because of peri wound resistance, this person's skin is dry, this person's skin is wet, um, you know, hydration status, maybe have old electrodes. So there's a lot of factors that affect that. As a general rule though, to achieve that dose range, voltage is typically set between 75 and 150 volts when using high volt pulse current. Okay? If you have sensation, that's usually felt, <clears throat> excuse me, as a strong, tingling paresthesia. It shouldn't be uncomfortable, but it should be strong. Okay? As you can imagine, we're not looking for contractions in this case. We, you, know, you have something that's potentially bleeding. We don't want them bouncing all over the place. Okay, so it's sub-motor. Most of the wounds I see, though, don't have sensation, or most of the people with wounds don't have sensation. I think spinal cord injury, pressure ulcers, diabetic neuropathic foot, etc. So how do you do that? How do you figure out how strong to go? Well, it's simple. We go up high enough till you see a little bit of twitching and back off until it goes away. Okay? Since they can't tell you this is strong or this, you can go up more or what. And then lastly, the decision to treat with the anode or the cathode is goal dependent. So we'll go through each of these individually. But if your goal is to reduce infection the most current recommendation would be put a silver dressing on the wound that's conductive and put your anode over the top so you can repel the silver dressings into that wound. If you want to promote skin growth, epithelialization, put the cathode over the wound. Same for granulation. If the goal is autolysis, which honestly you don't see a lot anymore because there are other, method, other modalities out there that can debride a bit faster. We'll actually talk about one later. Um, you would use the anode. <clears throat> and you know, if you don't have these other devices, then this is an excellent option. <clears throat> so here, like I said, here's the most common setup for infection, is putting the anode over a silver dressing that's in contact with the wound surface. So the, I guess the only hard thing to remember is make sure you put the gel between the silver and the electrode as opposed to electrode, silver, gel. Because then you won't be able to push the silver through that gel. Okay. <clears throat> so we already discussed that mechanism of action in terms of how that works. Okay. There is also evidence, though, of using e-stim high volt to treat infection when you're not using a silver dressing. That evidence gets a little bit more murky. Okay? <clears throat> there are studies that found direct current to be either bactericidal or bacteriostatic when you applied it from either the cathode or the anode. So again, another question, why? Well, it's thought, it's all theoretical, that the mechanism by which the direct current kills the bacteria is by producing those electro electrochemical changes at each pole. So you're making the environment too acidic or you're making the environment too alkalytic or basic for the bacteria to thrive. Okay? Kind of like pouring Dakin solution on it or <clears throat> acetic acid. Okay. So, <clears throat> in other words, it's that creation of an acidic or alkaline environment that seems to be cytotoxic, or kill those cells. With high volt, there's some conflicting data as uh, some studies show that you can treat with the anode, no silver, just the anode, is more beneficial <clears throat> than treating with the cathode. Then you have another set of studies 
that found no effect of using the anode. Okay. What gets tricky is the outcomes you're looking for. It's very hard without doing cultures and biopsies to determine what exactly is growing in the wound and what other factor it may be. So that's where you get a lot of discrepancies in the literature for a wound care. Now, if we talk about the studies using the cathode, they have overall favorable results for killing bacteria. So my recommendation would be <clears throat> if you were gonna, if you had a silver dressing, I would do it this method. I'd do the anode over a gel, a conductive gel over a silver that's in contact with the wound. If you don't have a silver dressing, I would recommend using the cathode. Okay. <clears throat> um, but again, pretty decent idea why it worked when it was creating an alkaline or an acidic environment. Remember, the high volt didn't do that. So why does the cathode work? I don't know. That's our next research project, I guess, or one of them. One of a hundred that have come up this weekend, so that's kind of cool. <clears throat> All right. If we were talking about electrical stimulation a couple years ago for wound healing, this is what it would have looked like for epithelialization, and not because it's in black and white. Okay. The common consensus was the anode should have been used over the wound site to stimulate wound healing. Okay. But as we started to realize that cells and tissues don't respond to electrical fields the same way that just a charged particle does because of all those other migration factors, we started to change the way things worked. So now the suggested protocol is opposite. It's the negative electrode, the cathode, over the wound site to stimulate new skin growth. Okay. <clears throat> the cells, I'll ask you and then let you think about it. Which cells are we most concerned about recruiting if our goal is epithelialization? Remember which cells did that? Those were our keratinocytes. So those are the ones we're looking for. <clears throat> okay, so you have the cathode there, anode, somewhere else. Usually a big area, like the thigh, because we don't want to build up a charge at that remote spot, right? So we'll use an electrode maybe this big, so the current density is very low on my reference or dispersive or other pad. Okay, <clears throat> okay. if we want to promote granulation, now we're trying to attract which cell? Our fibroblasts now, right? The fibroblasts also move towards a negative pole. So the cathode, again, would be placed on the wound surface, and the anode, just like before, is placed somewhere else. The last one, <clears throat> autolytic debridement or autolysis, when you're trying to remove non-viable tissue is what that means. So the cells in that case, which cells were they that came in early, used phagocytosis and ate up all that garbage? Our neutrophils and our macrophages. So we're recruiting neutrophils and macrophages. Both of those migrate towards the positive pole. <clears throat> So if you have a necrotic wound, you should treat that with the anode and then a larger cathode somewhere else. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the slide you want to write down. Clinical recommendations for non-infected wounds. <clears throat> because of the many discrepancies between data related to polarity, some of the recommendations are evidence-based. Some are best practice. Okay? So current best practice recommendations for high volt 
for a non-infected wound include begin with the cathode. You start your treatment with the cathode. The reason I say for a non-infected wound, because our first treatment in that case would be a silver dressing with the anode, right? So you're going to start with the cathode and use it until wound healing stops. So we'll measure it by, um, actually, if you want to take a picture, wait a minute, because I'm going to put up three more things. It'll be easier. Um, <laughs> so the uh, well, wound measurements is really what we're looking at. If it's getting smaller, good. If it stops or gets worse, now we switch to the anode. So progress stops, regresses, switch it back, and keep treating with the anode as long as you're making progress. So this is really easy. I like it. Wound care for dummies. Um, <clears throat> now, what do you think we do next if it stops? You don't have many options. Let's go back to the cathode. So if no healing is being made, the recommendation is switch it back to the cathode. Keep in mind the reason this is so important. Think back to the earlier lecture. Did we have inflammation here and then proliferation starts way over here? No, they all overlapped. So what you're trying to do is, I don't know, keep the wound guessing basically. <clears throat> and the recommendation is typically seven to 14 treatments, and then you can imagine you just keep going back and forth. So just a few quick contraindications. I know you know the million lists of things that you always see, don't east him the eyeballs and all that stuff. What I want to talk about are ones specific to wound care or ones that you're going to commonly encounter. So because east him is often an option for wounds that won't heal, it's important that we rule out certain reasons for non-healing wounds before we initiate therapy. So a major one that's not going to heal if somebody has a basal or a squamous cell carcinoma or melanoma, so cancer. I don't want to east in the cancer because I don't want to cause all the great changes we're getting in my healthy tissues to happen to the cancer. It's doing just fine on its own. Doesn't need our assistance. Okay. <clears throat> The second reason that a wound might not be closing is a bone infection or osteomyelitis. Okay? The reason for that, that we don't want to do e-stim, is I don't want to encapsulate that bone infection. Okay, so I'm going to have, I can heal this, the tissue, that's not necessarily infected. But then what do you do with this abscess of a bone that's stuck in there? Now, the tricky part with that, if the bone is being treated and is responding to antibiotics, you can use e-stim or pretty much any other modality that you want to. You know, we're not necessarily concerned about a knee replacement or something, but we're not going to do high volt over an implanted defibrillator or a pacemaker or directly over the heart and the, or the throat and make them stop breathing because we've contracted so hard. So kind of common sense, but I have seen wounds where the heart was exposed. You could see the heart beating inside the wound. So obviously got to take some pretty um, aggressive precautions. Okay, let's do some case studies. So there's pictures of wounds coming up. Sixty-year-old male, he has diminished sensation due to diabetes sustained um, he sustained a traumatic wound to the dorsum of his foot. Okay. He's had two failed split thickness skin grafts. So what's our plan? I'll let you kind of process that for a minute. <clears throat> so what you want to think about, what polarity do you want to use? Where are you going to put the electrode? Where are you going to put your other electrode? How intense are you going to, how strong are you going to make the stimulus? Okay. 
And then one thing we hadn't talked about yet, how often and how long are you going to do the treatment? And then lastly, how are you going to determine if your treatment's working? So my recommendation here, it's a healthy looking wound, clean. My major concern in this wound would be to promote epithelialization. And it may be a little hard to tell if that's healthy looking there or not. But <clears throat> so if I wanted to promote skin growth, epithelium, I'm going to use the cathode over the wound. Okay? I'm going to put the larger, much larger anode somewhere else, on the thigh maybe. Okay? How strong do I push this up, given that he has diminished sensation? Till I see fasciculations, okay? till I see muscle movement, then I'm going to back it down. So can't feel it, go up to the contraction, back off just a little bit. In terms of frequency, really the more the better. Now, if, if you can do five days a week for 30 to 60 minutes, do it. That's perfect. And then how are we going to monitor progress? We're going to look to see if the wound is getting smaller. Okay? Second case study, 26-year-old with spina bifida. That's the plantar aspect of his heel, the bottom of his foot. Um, presents with an ulcer of unknown duration, exposed bone, and increased necrosis. So now, what's your plan? Let's do a show of hands. Who wants to east him him? Who wants to not east him him? I don't want to east him him. At this point, because of the likely bone infection, you're probing right to that bone, it's green, it's nasty. I would want a bone culture first. Get a bone culture, find out what's growing, allow the surgeons to excise it, to take out that dead bone, or put them on antibiotics, whatever their decision is. Once the infection is treated, now we can go ahead and start to do our e -stim. Okay, so at this point, this would not be a good candidate for e -stim. And Then the last case study, before we start talking about a couple other modalities quickly, 46-year-old female, sorry about the abbreviations, I don't know if they're the same, with diabetes, congestive heart failure, and end-stage renal disease. She also has glaucoma and is obese. She has a non-healing pressure ulcer. So what's our plan here? First question, can we do e with her, I guess? I would say she would be a good candidate for e -stim. The wound appears to be critically colonized with bacteria. In other words, it's not making her septic, but she's not going to heal that wound as long as that amount of bacteria stays. Okay. <clears throat> so the reason I say that <clears throat> is I'm looking at the shiny kind of film on the wound is why I say it looks colonized. So my initial treatment is going to be to address the bacteria. So best way to do that, silver dressing, gel, anode, right? <clears throat> Typically, um, you're going to do this for three days of daily treatments with the anode, and then reassess. An alternative would be those dressings I talked about that has the silver and a little battery built into it and then you don't need an external e device. Okay? That's going to stay on a little longer because it's a bunch of small buckets to throw on the fire instead of one big bucket to throw on the fire. Okay? <clears throat> so after those initial three days, then we would uh, switch to our cathode stim until the wound healing stops. Okay? So now let me go through a few other modalities that you may or may not have had a chance to work with before. Um, in the remaining time we have. So the ones I would like to talk about are low-frequency ultrasound, 
pneumatic compression, and then because if not all of us, almost all of us are physical therapists or physiotherapists, exercise. We're kind of, you, uh, you meaning ortho, neuro, pediatrics, the rest of the PT world is like move, move, move. You always have your patients moving and wound care were stop. Like we always want them, no weight bearing, no moving, no this, no that. And is that really good? Let's, let's see. <clears throat> so with low frequency ultrasound, uh, really for ultrasonic debridement, is one of the newest interventions employed by many wound care providers. Um, physical therapists use it a lot in the United States. Um, and what it's classified as is a low frequency, high intensity debridement okay, or device. So by low frequency, actually, I'll, never mind, I'll come back to that. <clears throat> what it's used for is to remove biofilm. That on that last lady that had the shiny film on the wound, this does a great job of that. Versus picture yourself with tweezers and a scalpel trying to cut that off. It's not going to work. Okay? <clears throat> so for that, that adhered stuff that Sharps doesn't quite cut it, it works great. I'll show you a video in a minute. But, um, there are, the tricky part is because you can see the change, there's not a lot of like, randomized studies. It's, yeah, it worked. I'm going to use it again. Okay? Um, but it does have a lot of case studies out there and in vitro evidence that shows the ultrasound debridement can effectively destroy the bacteria and also improve blood flow. <clears throat> so because this is a debridement, you would use your same precautions that you would use, precautions and contraindications that you would use for Sharpe's debridement. Okay, so somebody that's in excruciating pain, this is not the modality for them. This is not pain-free. Somebody with no clotting factors, not gonna use this, okay? <clears throat> uh, if it's completely necrotic, dry gangrene, we're not going to debride it. Okay. Um, so because of that, the most important thing, the machine itself is very easy, the most important thing is to do a full workup in terms of their adequate blood supply, their clotting mechanism, and really to just rule out whenever debridement would not be appropriate. For example, pyoderma gangrenosum, a disease where if we debride it, it gets bigger. Prior to this, this lady is 83 with an extremely tender wound on her, the posterior Achilles. Prior to treatment, we put a topical um, analgesic ointment, like lidocaine. She's also using an enzyme that we have her doing at home. Okay, so we do the debridement and then maintain it with the enzyme. So on the top, you can really see that fibrin starting to slough off and it's much redder, or I hope you can. So what you are seeing, the, um, the treatment head has a small little hole where saline comes through and the saline carries the ultrasound waves. You know, just like you can't have your ultrasound and hold it up because of the quartz crystal, same thing, we need a conductive mechanism. So that saline mist carries that sound wave so the, um, the sound head doesn't get too hot. Okay? This is a thermal mechanism though, um, so it can be uncomfortable. So although, like we said previously, the inflammatory process is absolutely essential to normal wound healing. Sometimes it extends beyond that normal stage and can significantly delay wound healing. Typically if we have too much infection or protease activity or other things that just slow things down. Okay? <clears throat> so if you want to, picture the inflammatory process as a series of checks and balances. Some things 
are pro-inflammatory, are going to promote inflammation, while others are going to diminish the inflammation. <clears throat> if you have a problem with either one, wound healing can be impaired. Okay? So in animal and human studies, we've seen the ability for exercise to increase the expression of anti-inflammatory factors and decrease pro-inflammatory factors. So we're getting the best of both worlds there. For the sake of time, I'm not going to talk about any animal studies, but I'll mention a few human studies. Um, <clears throat> but I should point out there's a ton of interesting data out there on animals. So among the positive outcomes associated with increased amounts of exercise in healthy adults, so keep in mind these aren't injured, sick, or typical wound care patient, are decreased creatine uh, C-reactive protein levels, lower white blood cell counts, decreased uh, plasma fibrinogen levels or concentrations, and elevated C uh, serum albumin concentrations. Okay. All of those are good. With increased leisure time activity, we saw basically what we're saying, less inflammation in that group. <clears throat> In this study by Starkey from uh, 2003, eight healthy young male subjects were examined to look at the effects of rest, exercise, and an infusion of interleukin-6 on inflammation. Okay? So the interleukin-6, they anticipate a rise in your, um, <clears throat> or excuse me, let me, let me keep going. What happened was the subjects are all given a bolus of E. coli, an endotoxin. Okay, so they would inject them, and then every subject did all three parts of the study. Okay, so just randomized in the order. So you were injected, and then you rested, and then they monitored uh, your TNF alpha levels. Another day, you exercised, and they monitored your TNF alpha levels. And the third day, you had an injection of interleukin-6, and they monitored your TNF-alpha levels. Okay. So when the, based on their pilot data, what they anticipated was when you injected someone with interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory marker, it's telling you there's inflammation going on, that should go up two to three times. Okay. So on days the subjects rested, <clears throat> that's kind of what happened. TNF-alpha levels went up a lot. <clears throat> when the, on the days that the people exercised or on the days they were in, uh, injected with interleukin-6, which inhibits further production of TNF-alpha, you didn't see a rise in TNF-alpha levels. So the interleukin-6 makes sense. It inhibits TNF-alpha. What about the exercise? Well, their conclusions were that exercise <clears throat> produces interleukin-6, which in turn mediates an anti-inflammatory response against TNF-alpha. What about blood flow? Like I mentioned with some of the low, uh, with the biphasic current and the increase in wound healing, potentially it's due to this. In order for a wound to heal, really the most important thing is an adequate blood supply. You can throw a million dollar dressing on that wound and do whatever else you want, but if there is no blood to keep those tissues viable, it's a lost cause. Right? <clears throat> so by increasing exercise, we're getting that neoangiogenesis, the increased um, <clears throat> excuse me, oxygen delivery to the tissues, as well as increased removal of metabolic byproducts of CO2 so it gives it that nice, healthy environment to grow. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the systemic stuff, because we know that. But in addition, we have some local changes. So we have increased capillaries and increased enzymes. The capillaries, getting more blood there. The enzymes, once you have the blood there and you have the ability to transport it to the mitochondria where you can use oxygen, the more 
aerobic enzymes you have, the more fit you're going to be. In other words, the patient will be able to work out longer at the same intensity. Or they'll be able to work out at a higher intensity for the same amount of time, okay? which is the whole point. We're saying if we don't exercise these people, their wounds just get worse and worse and worse because they get sick. In a 2005 study by Emory, <clears throat> they looked at acute induced wounds. There aren't a lot of studies, surprisingly, that look at exercise that has an outcome of wound healing. Okay, they might talk about increased blood flow or uh, quality of life outcome, but the actual outcome of wound closure is small. But exercise in this study did appear to be beneficial. These, the study involved uh, acute wounds in healthy adults with an average age of 61 years old. So wounds, these again were experimentally created, so that is an issue. Does this you know, follow the same rules for our patients? Um, but what they found, the exercise group healed in an average of 29 days, while the non-exercise group took about 10 days longer to heal those exercise, uh, the experimentally induced wounds. So I guess the reason I put that in is don't forget that the wound care is not a separate aspect from other PT. So even though some people may not be wound care therapists, you're a vital component to that team. Probably the most vital, I would say, is the exercise component. And we can use the e-stim for high volt, as well as all the e-stim for NMES, for the pain control in our wound care population. And just as one quick aside, uh, we do use a lot of TENS in our wound care patients, um, more for procedural type things, dressing changes. Um, maybe I can't get someone to wear a garment because it hurts and they keep taking it off. So we can put the TENS unit on them with the garment and then they wear it longer. So don't forget to think outside the box a little. Just because you're doing wound care doesn't mean it has to be HVPC. Don't forget what you know about strengthening with your other, uh, strengthening or managing pain. Lastly, thank you for allowing me to come. And thanks to my wife for letting me come here while she stayed home. <clears throat> thank you.